Hello, everybody. Welcome to an exciting episode of Observable Flutter. I am really looking forward to this one today. My name is Craig LeBenz, and I am your host as always. Uh, before we get too deep into this, I do want to cover a few ground rules. Remember, everybody, uh, this is the Flutter community, and we are you know, we take respect for each other very, very, very seriously. Uh, now, especially today, as we are talking about, I think, inarguably, the most controversial, the most exciting uh, topic in all of, well, really UI development, state management, uh, it's going to be very important that we all remember to stay respectful, especially in the chat. And today there's an extra rule. Please do not discuss other state management solutions in the chat. Today we are talking about Riverpod. And that is because today's guest is none other than Remy Rousselet, whose name I, I think I'm saying that right. I haven't said it in a long time. Remy will let me know in a moment. Uh, he is a software engineer at Invertase and the creator of, originally it was Provider, the first uh, kind of anointed state management solution in Flutter. And then Remy thought that he could do better than choosing everyone's favorite state management solution and went on to uh, apply his learnings from Provider and started working on what we now know as Riverpod. And today we are going to dive into Riverpod and We'll have a bit of talking about how to use it, but also a bit of talking about how it works behind the scenes. So I'm going to bring Remy in here. Uh, Remy, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. What about you? I'm doing great. Uh, I am very excited. I have, I have to say, I have not, I've intentionally not really done any preparation for this because I want to, uh, learn along with everyone and I want to be able to ask questions from an ignorant perspective. So I'm very excited to see what is under the hood of Riverpod. You know, of course, any of us could have just gone to GitHub and read it ourselves before the episode, but I wanted to hear it from you, Remy. I didn't want to draw my own conclusion. So I'm very excited. Nice. Um, um, it's also a quite interesting time to, uh, learn about Riverpod, considering if you're looking at the current documentation, something may be still in progress. So hearing it from the source may, makes things easier. Yeah, yeah, indeed. It's funny, the phrase hearing it from the source is uh, interesting when applied to open source software, because <laughs> I guess, yeah, <laughs> yeah, reading it on GitHub would also be hearing it from the source, but uh, mm -hmm. better to hear it from you. Okay, so um, I think you have some stuff you might be ready to share. Uh, I'm going to click a button here, and there you are. Ooh. Uh, so what are we looking at, and what do you want to kind of talk us all through to kick this off? Um, well, what you see right now is the source code of the counter example you can find on GitHub on the Riverpod repository. It's a basic counter is that you typically see in your Flutter create by default Flutter create application, but implemented with Riverpod. So as you can see here, we are importing Flutter Riverpod and also Flutter annotation, which we may talk about later, uh, using this provider scope widget, uh, which is a Flutter Riverpod widget specific um, consumer, those new fancy things. So yeah, we're not using a stateful widget here to make the uh, incrementation. We're actually using a Riverpod only. Yeah. Nice. And one thing I know you've talked about during uh, in, in your talk at Flutter Vikings back in September in, in Oslo was that you avoid calling set state to, to trigger a re-render. And one thing I uh, would love to kind of hear more about is like, you know, what set state does is call mark needs dirty or mark needs rebuild or whatever the method is, you know, are, are, are you still calling that method? Like, how are you telling Flutter to re-render if we're avoiding set state? Mm, 
Well, the, um, what I mean by avoid using set state, well, I, I, I don't fully remember what I said at that time, but I doubt that it was about not invoking set state at any point in your application. It's likely more about um, the way you change your state. Um, mm. So more about the trigger mechanism rather than uh, um, uh, using set state internally to update your UI. Because technically, most, if not all, packages uh, using doing some form of state management use some form of set state or mark needs builds. Um, the point is more about doing uh, an approach, using an approach for updating your UI that is the most maintainable possible. Mm. Um, and uh, my issue with set state when we use a stateful widget is that it's a very imperative way of doing things. So um, you have your initial state and um, encounter. And then you, have, you sometimes update it in your UI with scan plus mm plus. -hmm. And the thing is, when using set states and all, um, of course, pretend the logic, state is yeah. in like a button callback. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. Um, uh, it might be a bit broad. Um, might be a bit broad if we're just talking about this right now. But um, the logic tend to be a bit all over the place, and uh, you may sometimes forget to invoke it in some places or mm. things like those. Mm. And um, uh, of course, I don't really have a strong statement against that state. It's more about uh, what Riverbug promotes is a slightly different approach, um, where um, using Riverbug, things kind of updates by themselves. You don't really have to think about doing set state at all. It's just not even really needed anymore. Um, even same things for error link, for example, or loading state on link. In many cases, you don't even have to think about it either. Like, you don't have to catch exceptions and things like those. So it's more mm. about changing the way you design code uh, to make things better. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so I think, you know, folks who have used RiverPod in any capacity before have read that the first thing they need to do to get RiverPod going, exactly, is the provider scope. Um, so what, what can you tell us about the about provider scope? Is it just an inherited widget? I've honestly not looked because I, I want to keep the mystery for myself. Uh, right well, it's a stateful widget, which in, in its build method uh, returns an inherited widget. The uncontrolled mm. provider scope is a class you can use too, which this time is an inherited widget. Um, but remove too many things. Um, but it doesn't really matter. Um, it's more about, um, it's kind of like material app, where if you want to use team and all those sort of things in a material application, you wrap your, your application in a material app. Oh, material app. And that's the same thing. Provider scope is basically the same thing, but for Riverpod. So you, by wrapping your application inside a river, uh, provider scope widget, you're basically enabling Riverbot for your entire application. Um, in fact, um, even recently, I released a lint package, um, which contains different warnings uh, for when, if you use Riverbot to help you with your development. And one of those warnings is uh, if it detects a main function and there is no provider scope, but you're using Riverbot, it warns you, hey, you forgot to use that Riverbot is that provider scope widget because in many cases sometimes you forget to use it and so it has a quick fix to add it for you nice nice uh so okay this is a great detour i think into how a river pod developer would get all of this juicy extra linting set up hmm. yeah uh, sure um so basically when you get started with river pod uh in your pop spec um of course, you would remove these past dependencies and use version numbers right. instead. I just on the yeah. Riverbot repository, so I'm using uh, past dependencies. But typically, you would install 
as a flutter river pod or hooks river pod. Um, hooks is more advanced. You don't really need to. If you if you don't use flutter hooks, you don't really need to consider it. Uh, mm -hmm. That's more for the advanced users. For now, just stick with flutter river pod if you're a beginner. Um, the plain river pod package is if you're not using flutter, just maybe making a command line a package, or yeah. server application. You can use it on the server too. The provider, the river pod package is pure Dart code, so you can use it everywhere. Um, so yeah, you install for river pod, and maybe I would recommend installing uh, the generator too. So it comes in two packages, which is the river pod annotation package mm -hmm. and uh, river pod generator, which is right here, which is in your dev dependencies. Then if you do that, you have to install bitrunner too. Uh, Mm -hmm. Because you're using cogeneration, uh, which you may not need in the in the soon future, uh, but that's a different topic. And finally, um, the last step is I would recommend installing the new Riverpod lint package here, which will provide custom warnings for you. Uh, so you to do that, you have to install Riverpod lint in the dev dependencies and also add custom lint, which is a side package. Um, Mm -hmm. that enables uh, RiverPodLin to work. And once you've done that, you need an, one extra step, which is create an analysis option.yaml file, which is right next to your popsec.yaml. Mm -hmm. And you have to specify another plugin, plugins, custom lint. Custom lint. OK, then so from the there, lint must already be registering itself with custom lint. Yes, exactly. Kind of like with build runner, you install build runner and then you install yep. your generator. Here you install yep. custom lint and then you install your link package. Got it. Great. Okay. Uh, all right. So we've seen RiverPod scope. It's an inherited widget. Um, how does the RiverPod scopes inherited widget, which is a funny name, uncontrolled uh, RiverPod scope? Um, how does it know about all the different RiverPod providers that people create along the way? Um, well, that's the thing. By default, it doesn't. Um, it knows about them as soon as you start using the providers. Um, providers mm -hmm. are all lazy loaded, um, and so they are not. They are not instant. There is no state associated with the providers unless you start using the provider. Uh, and so by default, your provider scope doesn't even need to know about the providers unless it's used. Um, so yeah, when you first read your provider, um, the provider scope will be uh, interacted with by your by the different robot APIs. And then at this point, it, it will start to know about this provider. Got it. Yeah. Can, can we look at some of that code? I, I'd love to see uh, how that comes together. How? Yeah. Sure. You know what? Yeah. Um, we pass Riverpod a provider. You know, is there a map that it puts it in? Like, how does it hold on to all these? I mean, maybe one first step would be to talk about the consumer widget because uh, sure. we haven't yeah, talked yeah, sure. about how to consume providers, and maybe talked about how to define a provider. Um, so first, defining a provider, um, since we're using the generator syntax, is we're making a Riverpod annotation, and then we annotate either a class or a function. So uh, if I want to do a counter, I can do count and pass as parameter count ref, which is the function name with a capital, and then followed by ref. Uh, the, we name the variable ref, and then we return whatever, so zero. Save, the generator runs, this is now fixed. And then inside our UI, uh, we need what we call a consumer widget to consume providers. So we, we don't rely on stateless widget, we use a custom widget type. So I can use uh, RiverPodLint to convert a stateless widget into a consumer widget for me. Uh, I do a quick fix, convert to consumer widget. And here we see it changed the base type and it added one extra parameter to the build function. Uh, which is a widget ref. This ref object is what allows us to interact with providers. You can find it here on widgets and in providers too, because providers can interact with other providers. And so here, uh, using this ref object, we have a few methods. 
as you can see with the auto completion, uh, like the ref.watch function, which gets the provider as parameter. And it uh, will read this provider and return the state of that provider. Um, and so here I'm using ref.watch, so it will read the count provider, which is this one, and uh, listen to the state if somehow it changes, which it may. Um, and if um, if it does change, then the widget associated with it will re-render. So that's the basic logic for using a repub. And so to answer your question um, about how these are interconnected, um, we can look at ref.watch function here. Uh, let's see, that's just an interface. If we look at the implementation, we'll see here. So that's the implementation of the watch function. Um, basically taking the provider's parameter and then, um, yeah, container. Container is um, it's a provider container object. Um, the provider container object is an object you would typically interact with if you're just using Riverbot in a pure Dart application. In a, mm. in a Flutter application, you typically use provider scopes. That's basically the same thing uh, under a different name because of a different platform. Uh, mm -hmm. A bit confusing, I know, but... Um, Long story short, um, provider scope and provider container are basically the same thing. Just one is a widget and the other one is just a plain dark class. The provider scope is an inherited widget which exposes the provider container. As you can see here with the provider scope widget, it has a provider scope dot container of build context uh -huh. which returns a provider container using the narrated widget API. So here I have a provider con I have a container. You can see type provider container. Mm -hmm. And then this provider container object has methods like listen, which takes a provider and then uh, invokes a callback when the provider changes. And then at that point, I can do something like set state to update the UI if I need to. Was that maybe too much? A lot of different things a bit advanced. <laughs> no, yeah, I think we'll we'll probably continue to hit some of these as we go. Um, can you return to the to the main file in the sample? The the count provider variable. I was I was I might have missed something. I was typing something in the in the chat about your uh, light mode versus dark mode preferences. That count provider variable that you you're passing to watch. Where did that come from? Yes. Uh, since I'm using the code generator, uh, basically when you define this, it will generate a, var uh, a variable associated with this. You, you don't pass count directly, you pass count uh, suffixed by provider. And so that's but here the function is named count, so that's count provider. If I rename it to count foo and I save, um, then that's count foo here now. Of course, uh, I renamed it here, but I forgot to rename the parameter, which is based on the name too. So the lint, oh. there is a lint for it to quick fix for you. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> so count foo and use an underscore here. Okay, so, yeah, nice. Okay, okay. Mm. So could um, it might be nice if we saw a very generic, well, maybe we just look at the generated code, but I'm wondering like, that generated code there, where you have the river pod mm. annotation, what is that equivalent to? Like what it generates? What what um, if we just collapse into this? Honestly, uh, I would prefer not talking about what the generated code is. I mean, I, we can talk about that of the fact that it's a provider. Uh, but um, from my experience, be, uh, beginners with Rupert tend to be confused by the old syntax, I tend to see a lot of different types of providers and uh, ask, end up asking the question, which provider should I use? Mm -hmm. But in my opinion, that's the wrong question to ask, okay. which is why the new syntax is here. It's, it's supposed to remove the question of which provider do you use? Instead, you just focus on your logic. Um, 
the idea with this syntax is that's just a plain function. Um, you can do anything you want with a function. Uh, you can make it async if you want to. You can return a stream if you want to. Uh, so it doesn't seem like now. this. This would, um, you know, how how would I increment this? Like if I if I wanted to to rebuild the counter using uh, one of these annotated providers, because this is just giving me zero. You know, how, how do I do something with this? Yeah. Um, well, first, if, if you were to return a stream, for example, you could uh, maybe update the value over time if you wanted to. Uh, like every two seconds, you obtain a new one. Well, GitHub Copilot have, is having a nice day. But... <laughs> <laughs> you Good could job, technically GitHub do Copilot. that if you wanted to, too. <laughs> or um, nice. if you want to have methods to update uh, this thing, like doing an increment method, um, you can convert your function into a class. Let me go back to the previous syntax here. So again, rename sys. Okay. So yeah, here we just have a plank function. Mm -hmm. And we could convert this into a class using another quick fix from the real wow. package, which now makes a class. Uh, so that's the class name, which is a function name we had before, cal now with a uppercase, which ex which has to extend uh, underscore dollar. Uh, this mm -hmm. thing will mm -hmm. disappear once we have metaprogramming, but that's for the future. Mm -hmm. And so here we see a function named build, which is basically the function we have here, but mm. in a class version, because uh, classes don't... Um, Basically, if, if I if I uh, do more fancy stuff here, hello world, and I do the converter again, you see that's once again we see our hello world comment again. This this function is strictly the same thing as this function. Basically, yeah, okay. the, both codes are strictly identical. It's just using this function syntax is slightly simpler if you don't need updates. Yeah. And so anyway, I'm going on a tangent. <laughs> No, um, I think tangents so, is the point of this. This is perfect. Yeah. So now that if you have a class syntax, you can now define methods in here. As you can see, the autocompletes yeah. yep. is telling me make make an increment method. And so in here, I have a state property uh, and various other properties. I have this state object, the ref object, which we saw previously. Same thing mm. as this one and the one on the function. So I can just call state plus plus and and that's all. And so in my UI now what I can do is I can make a button, elevated button, pressed here, and I can do um you know, the commission once again is working fine. And use this ref object which we covered previously. I can obtain the provider and since we defined a class, we can do pro my provider dot notif here. This notif here, what this does is it will return you the instance of this class. And so you have access to all the methods defined in mm -hmm. here. So I can just call, uh, invoke increment. Like you see, if I go on the definition of increment, it just lists me here. Nothing fancy in here, nothing is generated on those hood. So count provider, one, th one thing I wanna, I've, I've wondered, and again, I could have just looked this up, but maybe a part of me knew that I was going to one day start a live stream and invite you on it. <laughs> if on line, actually the line numbers are hidden, uh, but if, if you scroll down a little bit, uh, the line you were just writing, the ref.read in the elevated button. Yeah. So read, when you pass it, uh, let's say you just passed it count provider not the dot notifier, as we Americans call it. Yeah. Um, this returns just that state object, which was an integer, right? Yes. So how are you attaching dot notifier to integer to return the surrounding class? How are you doing that? I'm not, that, that's the point. It's um, basically the provider, uh, this variable here, the generated, the generated variable from this definition. 
Oh, is so an it's object not an integer. It's a way bigger thing. Uh, well, it's not a, an integer at all. Um, like right. is, okay. this count provider is an object which enables you to obtain either the integer or whatever else. Um, it's just uh, this variable is just a mean of communication. It's not a state in itself. In fact, this could very much be a constant. There is no I mutation see. involved. It's purely a mutable object. I see. Okay, so what's the syntax to get the actual integer off of count provider? I, I forget. Uh, just passing the, the provider by default. No dot okay. dot here. So there is some magic here. <laughs> so no. count provider, even though it's an auto I can, I can write a basic example without proof of body if you want. Uh, it's basically, you have, um, let's call it provider. It's a generate uh, object. I'll make um, an instance here, final count my provider, or provider, which is of type int. Mm -hmm. That's just this. And so um, now I have my uh, read function, mm -hmm. which is um, void read, which takes a provider of okay. type whatever. I'll add CSN mode. Um, yep. Yeah. So does uh, nice. provider int there need to also be provider t? In, in your read yes. method signature. Yes, yes. So I need another thing here, um, an abstract class, um, provider base t, which okay. just implements provider base. Okay, and then I use provider base here, abstract class. Okay, and so okay. in here, um, so here, if I do a main, I can do read my provider, which is here, which is our user defined provider of type int, and then I'd get a int here, uh, type int here. Oh. Yeah, so what is, what is the function body of this read method kind of vaguely look like? Uh, it depends on where you're invoking it. Uh, if you're in a consumer widget, um, it uses the context API. It uses the build context API to do um, provider scope dot container of context. Mm -hmm. We obtain the container from it, and then it returns container dot read the provider. Obviously, I made a new class, so it doesn't work, but. Right, right, right. That's it. That's basically the implementation of, of it. I can, I'm pretty sure I can look into it right now, and it would be exactly this. Read the, no, not this one. Read the provider scope dot container off, and just return read just in one line because why not? But with the base class provider listenable, that's the provider base I just made here. Same thing. And so for the dot notif here. It's basically in the provider object. I have basically provider base. Uh, let's return, I don't know, string here. Get notif okay. here. And so here, I can do dot notif here, here. And so now instead of an int, I read, um, well, provider base, I, I forgot the D. Yeah. Now I get a string from. If I remove it, I get an int. See, are you, are you following? Think of this variable here as just a key. Um, in fact, in one of my early experiments when looking for a way of improving over providers, um, when I use the good old inherited widget fashion, um, one of the common problem with provider was um, I have two providers of the same generic type. How do mm -hmm. I pick between both? Mm -hmm. And so when looking up for alternatives, um, one of the uh, solution was, um, uh, say I write some provider code, multi-provider, yeah, multi-provider. Yeah. And maybe make a second one. Yeah. 
So I add both both to an end. And I want to use it, I want to be able to read both. One of the things I was experimenting with was um, if I'm in a consumer, oh god, let's well, send mode again. <laughs> there, context here. I do context.watch and pass the in type. I want to be able to decide, do I want this one or this one? Yep. And with just the generic type, we were not able to do that. And so yep. I was experimenting with maybe having an optional key. Uh, well, not mm -hmm. key because that's a keyboard in Flutter, but I don't know. You need yeah, something. Power, yep. ID, something like that, ID string. Mm -hmm. And maybe in here, ID, you would specify yeah. which one you want, which yeah. would work, but that's a string and you can mm -hmm. do a typo yeah. in here and you'll get yeah. an exception. Runtime. Um, and I didn't quite like that. And at some point I realized, hey, wait a second. First of all, that string should be a variable here or foo. And I, re I should reuse it. That would be the first good practice you would do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just one. But then at that point, why just use a string? Why not use an object, object. In here, yeah. which would also add the implementation of this function here? Mm. So now, with just this foo object, I don't need this thing here, and I can just to context watch this. And so I do no longer need to define to insert the provider in the widget tree. And also it has an added benefit of there is never a case where uh, we are not able to find the provider because uh, there is always a default implementation, which is this one. So we don't have the provider not found exception. We can just default to do that. Mm. So it just, it just removes the provider not found exception. And so it solves kind of both problems at the same time, which is a neat, neat improvement. And so one of the later iteration of this syntax was now, before we used to do this provider and, and uh, with the ref and return zero. And now with the, with the new code generator, we do that function. Basically, this is identical to this. It's just, this is kind of weird. Like many people see a variable here and they're like, am I defining a global state? And I've always heard global variables are bad. Mm -hmm. why, is not, why is this not bad? I'm mm -hmm. confused and which is a valid concern. But if you followed uh, this foo variable is actually just a plain object with nothing in it. There is no foo.state in here. You cannot do that. There's no such thing. Uh, it's just a key. It's just like, like I mentioned before, it's just a, a plain string if I wanted to. In the, um, I mentioned in mm -hmm. the experiments before. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a combination of a, of a unique key with a default initialization function. Um, so whereas if we use the generator syntax, we, where again, both of these are equivalent, uh, we now see a function instead of a variable. And so it feels more natural to users because obviously global functions or if you do a class with the actual variant, if you define a class, nobody see, oh no, I define a class, but it's a global class and global right. classes are bad. Or no, I define a function, but it's a global function. There's not such concern. It's mm -hmm. a lot more natural. It's also as added benefits of um, suddenly a lot easier to pass parameters to providers because we have the full power of uh, a function. I can just do required int ID here if I wanted to. And so if I let fix the everything define because I messed it up everywhere. Okay. And provider. Um, did I? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because that um, here I define we still have our current provider, but now it has it requests an ID as a parameter, and mm -hmm. so when we try to read the provider, we need to specify the parameter, of course, mm -hmm. 
And so now I, inv I have to kind of like a function, you invoke it and you parse your parameter. And so now it knows so it's, it's an integer, integer, but yeah. yeah. Um, I could even use uh, optional parameter if I wanted mm -hmm. to, or maybe even default values. Both of, both of which would work which is just fine. You get a lot more flexibility on how you pass things around. Yeah. The syntax is much nicer. Now, when you added the other parameter, you count provider turned into a callable that you had to invoke. If the parameter yes. is optional, do you still have to invoke it? Yes. Okay. Uh, we could make it optional, but I mean, I don't see much value in it. Uh, just to be consistent, as soon as you pass parameters, just make it a function. You have to call it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What error do you get there, by the way? It, it's just going to be a, like a, a parse error, right? Just like a... Yeah, it's argument type. It's not. It's yeah, not. Yeah. It's, expect, okay. it's expecting a provider, but it's not a provider. It's a, basically a function. It's a class with a call method, which is basically a function. The slight difference is that as opposed to just a normal function, because technically we could do a provider e account provider and return that we could do that for the for this thing uh, but mm. the slight issue is that there, we cannot have methods on functions if um and one of the interesting features Rivbot adds is it offers some testing utilities for your providers so you can mock them if you want to okay uh, so if i want to show you um how to mock a provider Basically, you go to your provider scope or provider container if you're just in plain Dart, and there are optional parameters in here. You can specify overrides, and in here you can pass providers you want to override. So here, the interpretation is correct once again. And um, well, of course, yeah, let's remove the parameter for now. Um, I want to override the default implementation of my counter, which is just returning a custom value. And so now if I read the account provider, it will return 42 instead of invoking this function, which is it, which is useful for testing because maybe you have a service here and it's doing HTTP request and you can instead return a fake service here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With mocked HTTP requests, uh, things like those. And so, yeah, that's the reason why it's not using a function because uh, then in uh, using the if you pass parameters here, uh, your count provider still has those override things. Um, you see, should, should be up to date now. Override. Um, where is it? I think the change might be confused. Let's see here. Oh yeah, I, I, I know. I think I forgot that the cut generator currently doesn't generate those methods, but should be fixed soon. Um, okay. Yeah. Let, let's Where, when you that. first when you first wrote override with value, my my question was, is this a method that we have to implement, or does Riverpod provide it? No, 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 no. It's implemented by Riverpod. You don't have to do anything. Okay. Uh, oh, okay, man. We have hit a lot. So, can we go back yeah. to? <laughs> Yeah, I, I kind of want to summarize everything right now, or at least take a stab <laughs> at it. I loved, by the way, the walkthrough of the mental steps that you took to go from provider to Riverpod. How the problem of not being able to differentiate between two providers of the same type put you on the path of like, well, okay, I could give a key, but then... Why would the key be some arbitrary value like a string? It could be the object. Wait, objects can be rich. They could just have the other functionality. And you know, things just kind of kept implying one step implied the next step, which yeah, you know, at the risk of minimizing all the hard thinking that you did, because <laughs> you were the only one to figure it out. Uh, you know, the the stroke of or the indicator I think of, of really good design is it seems so obvious in hindsight. Um, 
you know, put you on the, on the, that path of evolving your, your thinking and your API design from provider toward river pod. That was really kind of neat. Um, but okay. So we're, are we back at basically the beginning now, the state of this file close to, uh, when we started talking, uh, I can go back a few more. Yes, should be good now. Hmm. Yes. Um, so yeah, I, I know that I went on a quite a few tangents, so it might be a bit confusing to follow. Um, well, but, I, yeah, um, like I said, I think the tangents are are the point. <laughs> but yeah, it, yeah, I, I'd love to try to, to summarize this. Yeah, and, if, and maybe if, maybe if we want to maybe synthesize the benefits of using Ripod, I think there is a nice example uh, mm. for it. Okay, sure. Um, which is, in my opinion, one of the neat use cases is uh, com um, making maybe a search as you type or um, an infinitely mm. loading list um, where you do a network request and it fetches as, as you scroll, things like those. Um, yeah, perfect. And it's fairly simple to do with Riverpod. Uh, you, uh, like, say I want to do an infinitely loading list, or or so far we can do both. This actually. is um, is great because infinitely loading lists are uh, famous. That's complex, right? Edge cases for a lot of state management libraries. Yeah, but it's yes, that's, that's the issue. It's edge cases for men. In uh, it's it's usually in edge cases, but when you think about it. Uh, it's very fundamental to what you do with mobile applications. You often do a lot of network requests, uh, a lot of uh, scrolling lists and all. So you want to make it as simple as possible. Um, so yeah, uh, let's do a simple, uh, let's fetch a counter delight by two seconds. Uh, so uh, that'll, fetch like them. Um, we'll do the goodie. <laughs> exactly. That's your ref. Is an async, and we can do await future dot delight duration two three seconds because why not and return um, ping. Triple ping. Oh yeah, three second load. very slow connection. <laughs> um, satellites. Hmm. And so obviously it's a paginated API. So we want to, uh, we have different pages. Uh, hmm. So we want to take a page yep. index. So int page. And so let's maybe show, return a string with the page index. Well, a list of item, list, uh, list of string. Yeah, perfect. And we'll return 50 items because our page is paginated using a page size of 50. So let's do, List generate fifty, and return hello uh, page, and then the index. Just gives us right. a yep. basic API implementation. Here, typically, you would yep. do your network request. With just this, you should be able to do everything. Okay, so from here, now let's focus on the UI. Uh, let's collapse him, uh, this. Let's remove the counter. Um, okay, remove the floating button. We don't care about this one too. This one is there. Okay. Let's make a list view. Because we always want list views. Yep. List view at builder, context, index. I don't see anything. Yeah. All right. All right, so I should see a list view here. Oh, I need to return something. Need return, to return yeah. context, hello. Yeah, lots of hellos. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't scroll. Oh, can I scroll? No, I can't scroll. Something's just something's funky here. Well, let's, let's put something differentiating. Put the index in the text, and then we'll we'll know. Yeah, but I mean, we should see some trans some form of transition now. Yeah, yeah. This now we'll know. No, it's yeah, not it's scrolling. Not, it's not scrolling. 
Um, Builder body item. Oh, you uh, item count. Do you have to provide the count? Shouldn't be needed. Uh, we can we can pass it to another if you want, but shouldn't be needed. Okay, it isn't fixing it. Because that's the point. Like the idea is with your budget, don't specify it, but we'll see later. <laughs> What's going on? Uh, um, I can restart on web. Let's see. Um, really puzzled. Might be um, enable work for this project. We'll see if it works. Otherwise, we can do the search bar too, which is basically the same thing. So, uh, yeah, well, we're, we're, chat we're, seems to think we're doing something wrong. Oh, whoops. Chat's coming in, so I clicked yeah, on the wrong thing. But, uh, I didn't even read that. I, I, I tried both C, Will, and... Oh, wait. Tobias Where says we it? can't scroll like this. What are we forgetting, Tobias? <laughs> but I, I use the trackpad too, and usually I believe the trackpad works. Yeah, on web is fine. Okay, let's do web. Um, all right. Uh, so we have our release. Wow, it's okay. 200 items. Nice. Um, so let's remove the item count and let's do something more interesting. So now we want to fetch the items. Uh, and so um, we have a paginated API. So of course, um, we want to, to fetch the current item, it's a current index. Um, mm -hmm. But here we're expecting a page. The thing is, we can calculate which page is associated with, is associated with a given index using some simple math. So, mm -hmm. for example, the page at a given index would be index divided by the page size, so 50. Mm -hmm. And so the uh, item index within that page would be item index equal um, modulo 50, the page size. Mm -hmm. And so from here, I can obtain the page uh, value, value equal ref dot watch my fetch item, and I the page uh, provider, provider here page page yes that's the type because we want an end. So here, now that I have the page index and the item index, I can just read my provider. Um, mm -hmm. So rav.wash, I buy the provider and I specify the page that we define here, the name parameter. And it gives me an async value of list string. That async values uh, object is because here we return the string, uh, a feature. Mm -hmm. And so we need to handle loading and error states because mm. the future can fail and it takes time so we don't yeah. just get the value here so we need to handle those so there is uh using the same thing value object we can do something called pardon matching using a, yep. a method on that object so page value and we use something called when nice it's basically a switch case, uh, which forces you to specify all the different cases. So loading, data, and error. So if there is an error, I can return a text with the error here. And the error takes two parameter, which is a stack trace too. Oh, nice. Uh, if there is a loading state, we don't have any parameter. It's just loading and we can return loading. And if we have the data here, we have the list of items. So that's the items. We see uh, list of string this time, no fancy thing anymore. Mm. And so now I can return um, text um, items and use this item index here. Item index here, All right. Okay, so there are a few things, extra things we'll need to do, but we'll see later. So yeah, it waited for a few seconds and then it loaded. Mm -hmm. So as you can see here, we now have already an infinitely loading list. It fetched the first page and since we have a big string, it, fe it started fetching the second one too. 
And yeah, if I yeah. scroll a bit, it's, it should start fetching this third one. And as you scroll, yeah. it, it keeps fetching. Okay. Nice. Okay. And you're scrolling up. This answer is the question I was going to ask, or at least suggests uh, well, how it would behave. <laughs> yeah. There, um, yeah. Let, let's continue. Uh, so first, there are a few extra things you might have to handle, though. Uh, I didn't handle everything yet. You still need to handle the case where you reach the end of the list. Uh, so for example, typically um, an API, um, if you go too far, if, if you fetch a page that doesn't exist yet, it will return an empty list usually. And so we can mimic this here by saying, hey, if a page is greater than two, let's return maybe just two items because maybe we have yeah. I ran in two items. A and I don't know, B. Doesn't matter. Um, so that's the last page, and it contains only two items. And so now, currently, if I reach the end, we'll like, likely have an, uh, an error because I didn't handle the end of the list. To handle mm -hmm. this, you typically just would do if the list of items is uh, items that length is uh, smaller. Um, well, no. if the item index is not is um, greater than the list of items, then you just return null in builder. I return the null in item builder. What this tells builder is uh, we reach the end of the list and we just stop branding items. So now, if I do the same thing again, we see A B and it just stops scrolling and I'm not. You see, I'm trying. It's just not doing anything. Nice. Hmm. Uh, another thing you might want to do is uh, maybe you don't want to show 10,000 loading at the same time. You just want to show only one. <laughs> one for the page, yeah. Exactly. And so this can be done fairly easily by saying uh, if uh, using the same trick, if the item index within the page is different than zero, you just return null. Once again, mm. it's, a trick, it's, it's a trick you can use again. Now, if I try again, you see, you only see one loading and then it fetches like and then the second page. continues and it fetches and if I scroll, it fetches and now we see the end. So of course you can use the same trick for the error on links too. Um, and so the, the interesting thing with this approach is all the business logic we did for this infinitely loading list, it's just this. We have like five lines of code, mm -hmm. um, maybe more depending on if you want with to the put some the spaces, we, we, yeah. but yeah, carrying commas and all, but you get the point. We didn't handle any error, like if somehow the network request fails, the UI will automatically show the error. It's mostly about what you want to do in your UI. The, you focus on the UI, you don't focus on the business logic anymore. You can just do your application. Interesting. Yeah, I have not done tricks like what you're doing on line 52 um, or 56 really ever before. Uh, that is, this is a, a new kind of way to think about translating between my business logic and my UI. Um, and, but so I, I'm guessing you've done a lot of this and you find it, it handles increasing complexity nicely. Yes. Um, because one of the interesting thing, like I said, is it completely, re it completely removed the need for dealing with um, if there is an error or things like those. Because if you were to use a typical approach, like mm -hmm. say you have a notifier um, class who you, you would typically have the list of all items, all items in here. And you would have uh, an add method in here uh, or fetch more. And then you need to handle, you need to do a try catch. You need to have maybe uh, an error object mm -hmm. in here. And all is loading. 
And there are so many different combinations of possible scenarios here. Uh, can get very, t very complex. Uh, like maybe the user scrolls very fast and so you're fetching multiple pages at once. Did you handle this properly? Do, do you have a race condition? Maybe that's possible. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, um, uh, whereas here, it just it just works naturally. Only what's visible currently will be fetched, and you don't need to deal with um, the scroll offset anymore. You just need to make a scroll uh, scroll controller. You don't need to make a scroll controller, scroll controller and listen to the scroll offset. It's just in the builder like you would typically do. You just read your thing and it just does it automatically. Mm -hmm. um, now, how would I how would I change this if I wanted to have some like local caching? Um, so it's already all, local cached, actually. Oh, just by the widgets? What if I wanted to leave the page and, and come back? Then I mean, then you just kind of wire a data layer into this method, I'm guessing, essentially. Uh, no, no, it, it, it is actually already local cached. Um, like if I if I refresh, like if I have um, um, what I'm already using here, consumer. Let's making a well. Maybe let's make to not confuse people. Let's make a set of widgets instead. Here, mm -hmm. I have a name count equal zero. Maybe show. Uh, count here. So here now we should see once it appears the count. Yeah. And I, I will add the, a floating button to increment it. Increment it. Floating button. Yeah. It's right here. Of course, it does a hot restart on web. So if I click on it, you see it doesn't refetch the thing. It's already cached. Mm. This is it. Because I know what I know what you're asking this question is you're maybe wondering why when I scrolled up it started loading again. It's because the page was not used anymore, and so by right, default so it, it can yeah it considers that since the page is not used anymore we can safely destroy this state. You can customize this thing by maybe caching it for a longer period of time. You could cache it for like five minutes if you wanted to, mm -hmm. and if you were to scroll up within those five minutes it would work. And so this is, it's cached just by the widgets, right? It's like uh, no, by the, the provider in elementary. Oh, the provider uh, is caching it. Yeah. It's basically your provider container. So when you use, when you specify this provider scope, internally, you see that's a stateful widget, which creates here. Um, this is state, where is it? Uh, provider scope state. And so the provider scope state has a property which is a container, provider container. And that provider container object is what stores all the states of your providers. So there is somewhere in here, a map, map provider, uh, which is a, which takes a provider as key and it contains basically the state object. And it, sure if we're, does we're it clear, continue but... to key off the different parameters, right? Because we have a, a parameter to this method for each page. Yeah, that's the thing. You have a provider for the function, but not for the provider. Because the thing is, uh, if I go, if I re-explain what this does, a parameter here, this fetch, um, no, this one. This function here, mm -hmm. it's basically uh, doing provider fetch items required in page. And it's returning a provider here. And this, this provider in, passing it, uh, in this specific scenario, we have a parameter, so it's passing the page. And this provider implementation overrides equal equal. So like it has the in the page. Mm -hmm. And we have override pager. It does something like that. And so now, if I do, if I have a map somewhere, map equal provider, I don't I know, see. whatever dynamic in here. I see. And I, I do 
that I can do fetch items. Let's see items, this one. And I can do map here. So uh, since this overrides the core equal, the key would be consistent. So, so if you change the parameter with a different value, yeah. the equal would be different and you would obtain yeah. a different state, which is why when you see here, you define only one provider, only only fetch item, yet you still yeah. you see multiple pages fetch at once. Okay, that mm. is fascinating. Um, <laughs> I followed that. I'd like to summarize it for anyone watching that didn't um, and or check my understanding because maybe I followed some of it incorrectly. But there's this internal provider class that is used as a key in a map that caches all the things. And well, it's not even internal. Like when you, when you, if you don't use a cloud generator and you do use the, use the old syntax, like such as this future provider mm -hmm. and whatever, the, the map key is your provider. Okay. That's, that's what I explained before earlier when I mentioned that if you, with provider, like the actual provider package, and I mentioned of the ID equal foo strings. Mm -hmm. uh, that variable would be your map key. You would internally inside, I don't know, multi provider if you wanted to do that. Yeah. That would be your key. But this, this key here is actually this object here. Right, 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 right. If you go back to the previous discussion, maybe read it a few times. Man. <laughs> and so when you use a method, well, there was some translation. Oh no, it's because the the code generation expands the method into the provider. Yeah, it's using uh, some, it's using a dark feature, right, which right, is right. Uh, which is uh, named callable classes. Basically, if yeah. you have a class which defines a function named call, a main here, and the final foo equal foo, and then foo behaves like a function. You can invoke it. You don't have to do dot call. Yeah, yeah syntax trigger for it. But yeah, it has the benefit of being able to define methods on it. So I can do foo and foo dot bar mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in any in any universe with Riverpod, whether or not someone's using the generator, their providers are keys in this internal cache. And by overriding equality, which is how uh, items are, you know, determines how items behave as hashes in a hash map, as keys in a hash map, then old, old data can be stored. Now, the one hop I haven't quite made is how there becomes, so remember when I said there's some internal class and you said, no, it's, it's just the provider. But when I have just a method and I call it with some parameter, that oh, it's instantiating a whole nother ob, a whole nother instance of that object. Is that right? So when we have yes. the fetch item class, it's ex internally with code generation that's expanded into a class, and every time I call fetch item, it's building an instance of that wrapping you know, invisible class, unless we open the generated file. And then it's that new instance that we've just minted, which was associated with a given set of parameters that will both do the work for us, it will call the method and actually load the data, and it will create a unique key, which is that instance of the wrapping class. And that sits wherever you've hoisted it, to allow for basically memoization. Is yeah, that pretty much sound mm -hmm. sound right? Yeah, sounds all right. Sounds right. As you can see here, uh, I, I could have yeah. just opened the source code. So we see here that the variable with is that the callable class with the call function, which takes the parameters mm -hmm. of our provider, which return a provider. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's a custom provider class. Uh, which takes parameters and then it overrides equal equal. 
Yeah, Nash code. Yeah. Hmm. It does a few extra things too, because there is actually a fancy feature I didn't mention yet, um, which is if you use the code generator, you actually have hot reload support, um, which which is basically, well, I'm, I'm on web, so obviously it won't work, but um, if somehow during live, uh, like you maybe have multiple pages in your application and you go on a specific page, which use this fetch item, and you change the source code of this function. Uh, in most approaches, nothing would happen uh, because it would still use the previous states. The implementation would have, it wouldn't reinvoke the function. Whereas mm. even even if even if you don't use the the code generator, it would still keep the previous state. Mm. Whereas with the code generator, uh, the code generator allows Riverpack to det to detect that the source code of your provider has changed. And so when the source code of a provider changes uh, on hot reload, Riverpad will re-execute this provider. And so if you change this, this provider, then the network request will be performed again. So you Got can it. stay on your page, iterate over your, your network request, and it will keep updating. Got it, okay. Hmm. Um... Okay, I had another question. And then we should look at some questions in the chat as well. I'm sure we're getting a ton of good ones. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to try to remember this one that I just had in my head. Ah, yes. You mentioned that we could override how long RiverPod caches things. Uh, yes. How do we do that? Um, first, one thing to note is that... Um, there are some improvements in progress for this. So for now, we have access to only the low-level API, so it might, it might sound a bit scary. Don't worry, it will change soon. Um, at some point, we had something, but I stripped it. Uh, I, I removed it because it, wasn't, it, it didn't satisfy all of my uh, conditions about the API. But anyway, um, uh, in a provider, um, once again, we can use this ref object, and we can call something called keep alive. Keep alive basically tells uh, Riverpod to not destroy the state of the provider mm -hmm. until the return object by this function, uh, which is a keep alive link, uh, until we call keep alive link dot cancel on this object. OK. And so or I don't remember which one. Is it close? Yeah, close. Mm, OK. And so. Um, so the basic idea is um, when your provider starts, you invoke keep alive, and then you could do, if you want to keep your the state of your provider alive for like five minutes, you could have mm -hmm. a timer. You specify a duration of uh, five minutes. And in here, you call the close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The nice. timer. And so this will keep the state alive for five minutes. But obviously, if you want to do that in a bunch of places, it sounds a bit redundant. You don't want to copy paste this over and over. Um, the thing is, uh, this API can be actually fairly easily refactored um, uh, by just making a function. You could do cache for duration, uh, an extension on ref, ref. duration. We keeps we copy paste this here alive because we're on ref. Well, ref is wait is ref the class name? I thought it was like widget ref and stuff like that. That's the that's the base class for this object. Oh, okay, okay. What is the error? And, oh, uh, that's for all to dispose. Uh, don't mind me. Um, <laughs> technically, you shouldn't have to. Do, you shouldn't have to do this uh, yourself anyway. Like I mentioned, in the future, in the future, right. this should be something built in Ruby, but just have to do this for now. So you may uh, there's this function, and so now you can just invoke this in your provider. Ref dot cache for. Wow, well, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, five, yeah. And you can do that in batch of providers. It's just a one liner, so at this point, it's very reusable. Yeah, um, hard yeah. to get shorter than that. 
Okay. Um, so there's a, there is in fact a lot of good questions in the chat, and one of them goes back nearly an hour. And Afak was asking a question similar to what I was asking, and you said, "Wait, I want to hit this other thing first, and we might now be ready." And they're wondering, does the watch method rebuild the widget? And that is certainly a yes. In the future, it sets yes. up the eventual rebuilding of the widget, but uh, could be time to maybe look at how the watch method works. Mm -hmm. um, basically, um, uh, you can think of when you define a provider, it's basically an observable object. Under, there is an observable object under the hood. Uh, and there are some ways to listen to changes on that observable object. So one of the way uh, that you can do that is, uh, once again, using the ref object, you can do ref.listen. It's a low-level API for listening to a provider. And then uh, you have a callback invoked whenever the provider changes. It takes the previous value and the new value, and you can print something in here. And the basic idea is watch is effectively this and doing set state. Yeah, so you yeah. uh, like if you if you do watch, um, like if I if I were to implement watch t watch t provider, you would effectively effectively do something like that, and then you return the current state of the provider. So ref dot read provider, something along those lines. Obviously, it's very it's very simplified for the sake of the example because I need to yep. deal with considering subscriptions and all. But that's the basic implementation, which is also speaking of considering subscription subscriptions. Um, that's one of the core reasons why uh, RiverPod was dissociated from provider, because one of the issues with inherited widgets is. A never stop listening. A widget never stops listening to an inherited widget as soon as you use this once. Say you do team dot half in here, mm. but only in a condition, like if condition. If that condition was true once and then it becomes false, the widget will still rebuild when the team changes. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting fact. But the thing is. Um, in your report, um, like like with our infinite list uh, example, like the infinite list example, it's a very neat syntax, very powerful. Um, like we can do a lot in a very small amount of code, but we are relying on um, a parameter which changes over time. And so this uh, and so basically, what this means is, if I were to basic, to effectively unwrap this without using parameters, if we were to use inherited widgets and dumbing down the example, it would be like if pages equal one, then you do uh, fetch item provider dot um, first page context page off. And then if page is equal to you fetch the second page. The thing is, if mm. the page change from one to, to two and you stop listening to the first page, Right. The first page would still be listened, but the thing is, it's not used anymore. Um, so the page, the first page, would still be maintained, and the state would basically be always in memory, even though mm -hmm. it's not used anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is this is the core. Uh, it clashes with the with this ability of passing parameters to providers, and passing parameters to providers. Uh, allows significant significant simplifications of our UIs as I showcased previously, and so for this reason, Riverpod couldn't use inherited widgets for updating UIs, and it had to use low level things, lower level things. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's that why we're not doing yeah. That's why we're not doing context of watch like we did in provider, but instead ref dot watch to work around this issue. Ah, interesting. Okay. I want to summarize this as well to both check my understanding and help make sure everyone's keeping up. Um, so inherited 
widgets, they establish a connection between the widget where you write, and technically it's the elements behind the widgets, but we'll pretend that's yeah. not relevant. So they establish a connection between the widget where you write that line of code, themed out of context or whatever, and mm. the thing above it. So in that example, of course, the theme widget. And the thing is, they're, they're basically, it's like a stream that never unsubscribes. So when you first write that method, or you first write that line of code, the widget where you write the line of code is added to a registry in that the Flutter framework is keeping track of all the hmm. dependents of each inherited widget. And there's no way to get yourself off that list. So if you just briefly need to listen to some inherited widget, you will in fact listen to it forever, you know, until the user exactly. navigates so far away that your stateful widget is completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so because you are not using that uh, machinery, because you're maintaining your own registry and your own stuff, um, you're able to functionally have that unsubscribe that mm -hmm. inherited widgets are missing. Exactly. Effectively, the way it works is um, Riverpod keeps track of what's used inside the build method. And so when the build method completes, it knows, OK, I stopped using this specific provider, so I can stop subscribing to this provider. Mm. Mm. Wow, so it, wait. OK, I want to I want to hear that again. I was still thinking about a previous thing. You said when the build method completes, the consumer yes. widget unsubscribes. Basically, uh, it's in the element side. Um, there is the uh, um, consumer element somewhere, consumer element, which which extends. Um, I don't remember which type, component element. Yes. And so in the component element, uh, component element, which is basically shared between stateless widget and stateful widget, uh, mm -hmm. it has this build method, which invokes the widget's build method. Yeah. And so what Riverpad does is um, it, does a tr it does a try finary around it. So it does super.build here, which will invoke the widget build method. And so, uh, um, in here, basically, um, um, how to say it? Uh, let's say um, we ha we usually have a list of um, dependencies, dependencies, uh, which is basically the dependencies used by the build method. And so, mm -hmm. in here, we copy the mm -hmm. previously listened dependencies. Yeah. And then on the build method, um, after here, you can like when we invoke them watch, them all out. Like, yeah. yeah, when we invoke watch, uh, we start listening to a specific dependency, so it adds it. And so in here, I have I now have the new list of dependencies and the old list of dependencies, and, and I can compare both lists and know if I stopped listening to a provide. Got it. Okay. It's mm, a bit low level once again, but. You shouldn't have, you shouldn't need to, to 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 care about this. Yeah, and in the end, it just means that there there are specific scenarios where unnes where RiverPod will avoid some sneaky unnecessary rebuilds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's essentially uh, what it amounts to. Mm -hmm. I mean, in in the context of Flutter, like for most inherited widgets built inside Flutter, the issue I mentioned is not that big of a deal. Because it's it's just plain uh, it's just basically team data. Uh, you, you, it's always available. It's never really destroyed. The, the team data is on the material app level. But the thing is, with Riverpad, our state um, uh, it's much more precise than just the team always available. Never never really changes. Besides, maybe when you, when you go to, into dark mode. It's like, like, like I said, the current page, the page can, can change as often and all. Mm -hmm. And you want to destroy the state as soon as possible. So you cannot afford to keep it more. You, you cannot afford to keep it longer than necessary in memory. 
Yeah, that's a really interesting point where if you look at a lot of the inherited widgets in the framework, I always close my eyes when I'm trying to like work something out <laughs> <laughs> to spare my brain the distraction of its visual field. When you use a, an inherited widget that's in the framework, it's something like fundamental about your app, like the screen orientation, or yeah, like you said, the theme, or, and there are things that make those change, of course, if the user just rotates their wrist, but a core assumption of those things is that of course it's fine to rebuild everything, or if it's a, a, a web or Mac, you know, a Windows, uh, a desktop window, and they, they drag and change the size. Of course it's okay to rebuild everything because none of, nothing we previously rendered is safe if something that fundamental about the the screen, about the interface changed. Um, so it's fine to just be like, yeah, we're gonna re-render everything. But that would, that in, in a state management solution, that would cause just an absurd amount of rebuilds. And so potentially the issue came no. if I'm really, oh no, it's, this it's not right. about It's not about rebuilds. It's not about rebuilds. It's about the fact that, um, in Riverpod, um, Riverpod makes sure that some that state is preserved in memory only if it's used. But the thing is, uh, if a widget never stops listening to uh, to some piece of state, it's always considered as used. And so uh, it's still in use uh, for River Riverpod still thinks that it's used, even though it's not actually used. And so it cannot destroy the state. Uh, Whereas okay. by fixing this, we actually can destroy the state as soon as it's not used anymore. Uh, oh. Yeah. So yeah, it, it has nothing to do with rebuilds because there are okay. providers, the provider package actually has some solutions to filter rebuilds already. And okay. there are okay. various optimization factors. It's, it's not at all about this. Not about rebuilds. Okay. It's about mm -hmm. not having the runtime memory footprint of apps. Yeah, grow or only mm. go up. <laughs> yeah, it's like think about like it could even be costly to not necessarily just memory. It's like say say you use Firebase and it's doing a query, but you change page, so the query it's not useful anymore, but it mm. keeps updating in the background because mm. it's still considered as used. Uh, that would be fairly inefficient, and you would want to pause this uh, query as soon as the user leaves the page. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. That you said that wouldn't only cost a memory. What if you use Firebase? I'm like, yeah. Then it will do the real yeah. version of costing, which is yeah. Funny. It costs costly <laughs> network uh, network resources. Network resources are also very small in general. Even if you don't use Firebase and you use your custom API, and maybe you do some HTTP polling to refresh some net, some API every x x minutes, because why not? Um, if the user opens 10 pages and you don't pause, you don't stop listening to your API if it's not visible anymore, you would suddenly be refreshing 10 APIs uh, at the same time, even if you only, only care about one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. That's super interesting. I had not really appreciated that that was... Um the nature of, I mean, I guess when you talk about disposing, I think when developer, when Flutter developers think about disposing things in general, you know, you talk about dispose, uh, disposing a stream, for example, you know, you got to close your stream subscriptions. That is certainly about wasted network requests, maybe wasted memory, certainly, you know, wasted kind of background process. Uh, but I hadn't realized that we were kind of getting into the same territory by avoiding inherited widgets and, and using the refs mm -hmm. machinery instead. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I can actually also pivot into another interesting thing you can easily do in Riverpod is um, when you think about network requests, uh, you want to make sure you stop them as soon as possible too. Like if say you, uh, a user has a, a, your application has a detail page and the user open, open a detail page and leave it as soon as, as soon as he opens it, because maybe he doesn't care, actually care about the digital page. He made a misclick and it changed again. Um, 
chances are when he opens the detail page, it started a network request to obtain information about that product. Mm -hmm. But the user doesn't care about it anymore because it already left the page. Mm -hmm. So if you have a slow connection, uh, the network request is still pending, but it's not mm -hmm. necessary anymore. So you likely want to cancel that network request to save as much resources as possible. Because uh, maybe the user will want to open a separate product detail page and yeah. you want to show those informations first instead of the old one. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, if you wanted to say console network, uh, do um, so if you wanted to do uh, to cancel network request in your pod, um, chances are your network request implementation would be something among the lines of um, if you use the Dio package, you would do Dio.fetch API. And I don't know, uh, JSON. Yeah. And send maybe return uh, whatever dot from JSON. Yeah. Lots of titles, but whatever. Um, and so if you want, to, so that would be your business logic for fetching, for fetching something. And so if you wanted to add a network cancellation, uh, network request cancellation, you could do these extra lines. Using Dio, you would do cancel token call cancel token. You pass it to Dio, cancel token here. This cancel token object would be an object where you can do cancel token cancel here to cancel the network yeah. request if it's pending. And so the thing is you can in invoke this cancel method on something called on dispose, which is a provider life cycle. This uh, on dispose life cycle is called when a provider stops being used and the state is destroyed because yeah. uh, maybe the user left the page and so it's not used anymore. So we dispose the provider. And so when we dispose the provider, you can also hook your console at the same time. And so if, if the operation was pending at that time, then the network request will be will be cancelled with just this line. Interesting. Yeah, that's uh, that's quite efficient. And mm. I'm not gonna lie, I've never cancelled a network request in my life. <laughs> yeah, and it's a fairly <laughs> advanced topic, but um, if you start thinking about it, like if you want, if you wanted to do it with um, um, Say you wanted to do some HTTP polling, for example, and um, refresh uh, refresh your API every five seconds. First, one thing you would do is uh, in Rupert, doing that is fairly easy. You do a timer. I don't care. Uh, timer, your duration, so five minutes, and then ref dot invalidate self, which is basically telling the provider to refresh itself. So in five minutes, refresh the provider and it will refresh this thing. Um, and uh, so basically, this would be a request which, which, which updates every five minutes. Uh, you could do the same thing in your UI. Maybe you want to do a refresh indicator. Refresh indicator in here on refresh. You can do ref.invalidate some provider, which will refresh the provider once again using a portal refresh. Um, the, anyway, the point is uh, when the provider refresh itself, it will invoke this undisposed function again. And so somehow, uh, if for some reason you have, um, if we take again the portal refresh example, mm -hmm. um, and the user want to do a uh, refresh indicate um, on refresh, ref refresh. If, if for some reason the user refreshes twice uh, because it's, it's very, you know, you know how users are, it refresh twice at the same time because, you know, you really want that data. Um, uh, then you wouldn't want to fetch the network request twice. That would not make sense. Whereas uh, by doing that, um, the, you, you would only fetch it once. By canceling so the this, request, this would uh, yeah, decisively mean that anyone who's like anxiously, you know, swiping again and again, again and again, they're just 
resetting their progress. So they're slowing themselves down. The other way you could handle yes. this would be to like to throttle or debounce or something, right? So you, you only yeah, refresh yeah. once every mm. five seconds or something. But, mm. but anyway, I, w I wanted to talk about this because if you compare it to say you want to do, um, um, what's the word? Um, HTTP polling using a an older approach. Mm. Um, you'd have your state here, and maybe in your constructor, you do your timer periodic. And um, in here, um, chances are, uh, um, what's the word? Let me think. Actually, I actually I thought about this, but I wasn't sure how to follow. Up. <laughs> um, um, well, it's okay. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we're, we're pretty deep into this. Thoughts, but... Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I, I I think maybe <laughs> I'll take one last scan of the questions, and um, you know, we we could potentially move into uh, to closing thoughts and. And get yeah. on with our day. I know your your dinner is currently uh, waiting for you. Exactly. So let's see here. I'm I'm skimming. I'm skimming. Um... Trying to find one that I think would make sense to build on what we've been talking about. I found a mutate data. Oh, this one's interesting. There's a lot that's interesting. No one else be offended. But Kevin says, what if I want to mutate data that's coming from a future on a client? So, but I want to have an optimistic update. Would you recommend to use a noter provider, noter, notifier provider that holds the state? Um, yeah, optimistic update. Notifier, I think not, notifier uh, for context, notifier provider is very specific. It's uh... It's an actual class uh, in provide uh, in RoboPad, um, and the the answer is uh, no because um, chances are you change from a future provider, and you're converting into um, into a kind of more like a if you're familiar with it more like a state notifier, which is a lot more imperative. You're basically by using a notifier provider, you're basically defaulting to doing things by hand. You start list. You, you do future dot and you catch the error and all. It's very tedious. Instead, what you should use is um, if you're not using the code generator, uh, async notifier instead, which is basically uh, if I write it here, as hmm. example, extends async notifier uh, response. The build method, and so basically, this is your future provider, and you can take the exact same logic in here. And now you can do your updates functions. Uh, I don't know, add to do because it's a list of to dos. You can do mm -hmm. your optimistic update in here, you add your to do, then you do your network requests like past whatever c to do that to JSON, and if some way it fails. Maybe you can do a try catch mm. and revert it to the previous state if necessary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That would be how you would do optimistic updates. And with the generator syntax, the async notifier is basically um, you just do your user class, you just annotate the class with at river path, and you keep your build method, everything is the same. Nice, yeah. So that that feels like a pretty standard optimistic updating logic, right? It's just yeah. decorated by, you know, surrounded by a bunch of river pod stuff. Yeah. Uh, there, okay, are actually some there are actually some upcoming features for this, which is the mutation issue. It should be coming in the, in the following months. So stay tuned on this. But, but yeah, for now, that's the basics. Uh, oh, here's a good one. Oat asks, so what's the point of using keep alive now that we have a separate method to dispose the river pod? Um, and the way I'm understanding this question, 
Okay. My inability to answer this question is partly what made me think, oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, if there's a method to dispose them, you know, that suggests that they're not auto disposing. But then if there's a method to keep them alive, that suggests that they are auto disposing. So what's the deal? Um, well, the thing is, in everything we've discussed so far, um, at all points, as the state was auto disposed, we never manually disposed the state. At best, we forcibly forced the state to refresh, but we didn't, we didn't just destroy it forever. We triggered a recomputation of the state. That's all. Um, and so uh, keep alive. Um, um, how, do I, how do I answer this? Um, <laughs> Oat has stumped the staff. <laughs> yeah, I just lost, just lost my train of thought. Um, basically, um, you don't invoke the dispose method yourself. Riverbot does it. Uh, it's more like what we've seen is you force, force it to refresh. You don't dispose it. That's not quite the same thing. Is that clear? Mm. So when do you know what Oat means when they wrote now that we have a separate method to dispose maybe there's some confusion there yeah that, that, that's that's what i said it's that we, we don't really have a separate method to dispose this thing we actually yeah. never did okay like, like at Do you all know what they might be here, we, of? um yeah i think they're referring to when we called um where is my provider oh invalidate self or something was that what yes it was for example, yeah in the, in the timer yeah. My crab that invalidate itself, or when we did mm. this in the UI, in the refresh indicator. Mm. So technically, this will invoke the undisposed life cycle, but this is because it, it disposed the state, but it creates one right after it. It's not like this, the provider is destroyed forever, it's still, it's still technically running. Okay. All right. Um, scrolling down more. I'm near the end of the list. Um, here, this is an interesting one, and I think it's probably a good place to to call it. Verbal asks, can anyone post some links to repos that utilize Riverpod with good practices? I would say, so you can't easily post links in YouTube comments. Um, the YouTube auto comment moderation machinery doesn't really like that too much. But this, oh, uh, Remy may just be sharing some right now. Uh, yeah, there's actually, you, you can go to the riverpod.dev website, uh, which contains a bunch of official examples and some um, examples made by the community. You can look into those. Uh, Mm. And so maybe inspect your source code for its inspiration. Um, so is that probably a good source of information? You can also join the Discord too. Um, if there are any questions about it, uh, like click, a, click here on the readme, it will redirect you to the Riverbot Discord. I'm not connected on nice. web, but that's the ID. Um, and you can ask questions here if you want. Uh, people can answer good practices. And also, um, the lint package technically should help you with good practices in general. Uh, in many cases, it will spot mistakes. So make sure to install this one too. Yeah, uh, goodness. I, I, I do feel like a teammate that I had in my previous company who was like extremely experienced really really good uh he would often summarize a lot of these things as like what do you want to complain about today too much boilerplate or too much magic and you know all solutions out there have to pick somewhere on the spectrum of boilerplate to magic that they you know that they ask their users to write and i think riverpod you've you've pretty clearly especially as you're moving more into code generation where you're continuing to hide the boilerplate you're you're taking a strong stance on magic and mm. that just means there's a little learning curve 
But then I think once someone kind of understands what's happening behind the scenes, even if just vaguely, now you can write so little and do so much. And, you know, well, it really is very cool. Mm. To be honest, I don't quite like the word magic. Uh, I wouldn't I thought qualify you might not. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's fine. it's fine. I understand where you're coming from. But in my point of view, um, Rupert tries to actually not have that much magic. Maybe maybe the generator is debatable on that topic, and I can agree with it. Uh, but to be honest, the fact that we need code generation, code generation is more of a language issue than anything. Mm -hmm. uh, Rupert mm -hmm. is kind of limited by dark restrictions. Uh, on that sense, because um, if we had, for example, function overloading in Dart, we probably wouldn't need code generation in that, in that context. But anyway, mm -hmm. that's getting in, in tangent. Um, Riverbot takes a lot of care in making uh, any form of logic very explicit, um, in the sense that, for example, if you were to compare um, without naming names, um, like in Rupert, you explicitly watch something. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas there are some alternatives where uh, you maybe have some state, uh, some object, and just just reading the value automatically flags the widget that's needing to update the value when the state changes. In um, if you're following, um, yeah, yeah, like yep. as soon as yeah, and so. That the approach of automatically listening to this thing, in my opinion, would be more log magical uh, as per the definition. Whereas here, this is a very explicit approach. It's just, uh, it's just that in Riverbot, um, rather than being magical or not not magical, it's more we're using a different approach than most common approaches. As you see, we didn't really made a change notifier and called notify listeners and also yes, there is a learning curve uh, because we're different from usual. So mm -hmm. people might not be familiar with it. But the boilerplate reduction, it comes more from the fact that uh, it's a different approach. Uh, and that, mm -hmm. that different approach enables us to go slightly further than other approaches, if that's clear. But of course, I'm biased. If you think that's magic forms, that's fair. Uh, I cannot counter you on that. <laughs> yeah, and you know, there's just things like lots of lots of really smart caching is happening, and even if you'd never thought about it, you know, stuff like that. I I know that in a lot of circles, the word magic is basically a swear word in in programming. Um, you know, I I grew up on the Django ORM. And there's basically nothing more magical than that piece of software. And it's one of my favorite that I've ever used. So I don't personally see it as a swear word or use it as a swear word, but I know, uh, <laughs> you know, it's interpreted differently by, by everyone, but man, Remy, uh, I had a blast. My brain is leaking out of my ears right now. As <laughs> I'm sorry. Done my best. <laughs> no, it's okay. As I've done my best to keep up, um, I, I think it I was keeping up to diff, to varying degrees throughout the throughout the chat. There were some moments where I was just like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and others others where I was where I was right there. Um, so folks, yeah, I mean, if you found this useful, you know, certainly join that. Join uh, the Riverpod Discord if you have outstanding questions from here, if you saw some code <clears throat> that you, that didn't quite make sense and, and maybe I glossed over it or the explanation just didn't land, you know, talk about it in that discord. Um, you know, I, I think there's going to be a lot of people there that are excited to, you know, excited to go into, into the weeds on how RiverPod works and, and also how to use it. Right. Because this has been very academic going behind the scenes, like the whole point, of these libraries is that you just need to know how some of the methods, you know, you know, you need to know what the methods do, uh, when to call them, how they're going to behave. The implementation is really extra credit. It's very, very academic. So, mm -hmm. but I, I thought it was really fun. And personally, I like to know how libraries work before I use them. It helps me understand when to call a given method. So, uh, Remy, thank you for all the work that you put into these packages. You know the linting too to save other people's time. Uh, 
you know, starting all the way back in provider where you were just kind of identifying friction points that you were experiencing developing in Flutter. And, uh, you know, you've, you've just always been someone who shares your solutions with the entire community. And man, we've all benefited from your late night and weekend uh, thinking about how to efficiently build a Flutter app. And, you know, from I think all of us to you, uh, thank you for everything that you've given us. We really appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. I really appreciate yeah. it. Uh, well, folks, I'm going to, I think we can wrap everything up there, but thanks for joining. And uh, as always, be sure to let me know what you'd like to see on future episodes of Observable Flutter. Until then, see you, everybody. Bye.